and tell them, say, we are Praise Cathedral, Church of God in Christ. I don't believe I have a witness, but the Bible says that when praises go up, blessings come down.
on, let's put our hands together, put our hands together all over the house, all over the house. Somebody said, Jesus is real. Somebody said, Jesus is real. Praise God. What a blessing. Want to thank God for you, 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 you. Amen. Join us on this morning live. Amen. From Praise Cathedral Church of God in Christ, 5895 Benz Ingerman Road. Let's give Jesus a hand all over the house. All over the house. On today, on today, amen, again, we'll appreciate you from around the world joining us on today. Our speaker on today, amen, is none other than our vice president of the International Department of Sunday School, Church of God in Christ around the world. Pray God. Amen. He's a member of the New Birth Church of God in Christ in Chicago, Illinois, where his pastor is none other than the Bishop Willard Payton. May I present to you on today none other than the elder Michael Payton. Let's receive him. The choir, the young people said that Jesus is real. If you know that he is real, clap your hands because he has been real in your life. As a matter of fact, turn to somebody and tell him he's been real to me. Oh my goodness, bow your heads. God our Father, we thank you for blessing us on today. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, for your long suffering. God, we thank you most of all on today for salvation. We thank you for the grace and the mercy you have extended unto us. God, help us today. Help us as only you know how. We pronounce a blessing even more on Praise Cathedral. God, bless this house as never before. Bind us together, O oh God. Pour out your spirit in a mighty way, and we will give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you turn to somebody and tell them, it's good to see you on this morning. Come on, find somebody else you haven't spoken to and tell them it's good to see you on this morning. Ain't nothing wrong with you going to shake somebody's hand. Greet them on today and tell them it is good to see you on this morning. If you all would let me read to you two scriptures and then you can be seated. How many of you love the Bible? All right, now we filling each other out. You judging me and I'm judging you too. I'm going to give you one more time. How many of you love the Bible? That's all I got. I ain't got nothing else. I've come to present to you the word of God on today. Please turn with me to 1 Samuel. And I know it's youth day, and I'm going to tweak this a bit in order to keep and engage our young people on today. 1 Samuel chapter 22. Mm-hmm. Let me do a little Sunday school test. Is that Old Testament or New Testament? Oh, okay, good. I mean, I'm just asking. Don't, don't jump on me. Uh-huh. It is in the Old Testament. Do you have 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 and 2? It says, There David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dullam. Somebody shout escape. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down hither to him, and everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a what? Yeah. Captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Fourth subject today, very quickly, can we use this point? I didn't ask to be anointed. Be seated in the house of prayer, if you will. Thank you, Jesus. What an honor it is to be at the beautiful Praise Cathedral, Church of God in Christ. This is an absolute magnificent church, and we honor the history, the legacy, the giants that came before us. 
Can somebody say amen? We are so grateful and honored to be here. We thank God for Bishop Shelton C. Rhodes. Can you celebrate the pastor of this house? We thank God for his integrity, his example. He has already put top Texas Southwest second. Uh-huh. They were already on the map, but, you know, uh, the word is getting out that this is a fantastic jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. And I came and visited this weekend to Sunday school, not to make it better, but because I've heard how great this jurisdiction already is. And we honor Bishop Rose. God bless you on today. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but don't celebrate and thank God for the pastor. Don't run and shake the pastor's hand and push the first lady out of the way. Don't say you love the pastor and you don't speak to the first lady. I'm from Chicago. I'm not scared of none of y'all. Mm -hmm. I know this is Texas, and it's about five or six people that got guns, probably right up here right now, but I'm not scared of y'all. Celebrate the first lady, Sister Deborah Rose, <laughs> one of our TX students for the International Sunday School Department. She is an absolutely magnificent woman of God, and we do honor her, we honor our supervisors in the house. Supervisor of Women, Yolanda Ford. We honor you, we thank God for you. We thank God for all of these fantastic women, the district missionary, to everyone that is here. This is Youth Sunday. Uh, can we celebrate with all of our young people? But in particular, four of them. Because on yesterday, your young people talked to about, oh, three or 4,000 other young people around the country. I didn't want to tell them that number to make them nervous, but I salute uh, Brother Jordan. Uh-huh, Sister Rose, where's the granddaughter? We salute Joseph and Joseph's sister. Where's Hannah? Uh-huh, they are here. Where's Joseph? Joseph? Joseph is going to be presiding bishop, so I just want to call his. I want to keep my little position, so I honor you, sir. <laughs> and it is such an honor to be here on today. Uh, there are three titles, uh, First Lady, that Bishop left off of my bio, and I'm going to have to update it. Uh -huh, please forgive me, that's not arrogant or conceited. It's just, I've worked hard in this church. And, and I just want y'all to know me by these titles. Because I've, I've, it ain't easy dealing with y'all. And I've earned them and I want you to recognize when you see me by these titles. And the three that Bishop did not mention is I'm saved and sanctified. <laughs> And I am filled with the Holy Ghost. Another Sunday school test. You do know you can go to hell even with a title and a position. You know your title don't automatically mean you sanctified. Oh, we're going to talk about David in a minute, but um, Saul was the king, but Saul had gotten fired. And God kept him in position. So it ain't about your position. It's about your relationship. And I got to keep my relationship with the Lord where it ought to be. I confess, supervisor, and I admit I shouldn't be up here speaking today. If you looked at my resume and saw all of the mistakes and all of the wrong, you wouldn't invite me to come to Praise Cathedral. But thank God that you ain't God. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm already running out of time. Let's dig into the word. Will you turn to your neighbor and remind your neighbor one more time, I didn't ask to be anointed. 
Oh my goodness, David in 1 Samuel chapter 22 is in a cave. Now I don't understand this. I don't understand why the Lord has a way of doing things that seem contradictory to what he said. If I was anointed to be the next king of Israel, why am I in a cave? Kings live in a castle. Kings ain't supposed to live in a cave. What do you do when what the Lord said don't match what you're going through? What do you do when your theology and your reality don't line up? I heard what Bishop said. I heard the message and the preaching. But when I got home, I'm dealing with the bills that are stacking up. I'm dealing with the grits that are lumpy. I'm dealing with the teenagers, oh my God. I got five of them, two of them in college. One is 23, the other one is 21. At home, I got three, a senior in high school, a junior and a sophomore. Don't bless my heart, let me hold something. I got these five teenagers who think they know better than me. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask for that. I sometimes ask they mom, what, what did you do to me? How did, I thought, oh, no, nah, be careful. I was asleep, you woke me up. You should have left me sleep. Where did these kids come from? Their attitudes, their mind, you said I could be myself on today. This attitude and their mindset that they had. I grew up with eight and I said I'm only having one. I, don't, I knew what it meant to sleep in a twin bed. Bunk beds with two at the top and two at the bottom with a sheet drawn across the room and the other three, the girls on the other side because dad was doing the best that he could. Uh-huh, and the Lord said, well, I'm gonna bless you, uh, but I'm looking at my life. I'm looking at what you chose for me to do. I'm looking at the reality of, of the struggle. I'm looking at working in the church and, and y'all fooled us. Y'all fooled us, supervisor, I'm just gonna be honest. Y'all said, come over here, the table is spread. And the feast of the Lord is going on. Y'all didn't tell us that the table that spread is at the after the valley. If you'd have told us it was before the valley, I might not have come running down to the altar so fast. How did I end up in a cave? Why is there a struggle? Why don't the Lord put us to sleep, ladies? Why don't he put us to sleep and give us a spiritual epidural? Why don't he give us a spiritual shot that numbs the pain and the struggle of delivering the gift that he put down on the inside? Why is this hard? when y'all said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is. I, well, I went to the tasting. I went to the ceremony and I, I looked at the food that y'all had on the table and I didn't know on the table I would have to eat forgiveness. Forgiveness don't taste good when people drag your name through the mud. I went to that table and, and, and I saw overcomer, but to overcome means you got to go through something. Uh, this tasting that y'all said, you gave us the right hand of fellowship and didn't know that some even the ones that we were shaking their hand would be the ones that stab us in the back. I thought the Holy Ghost was for when I was out in the world, when I had to go to work to teach y'all crazy, I mean to teach y'all young people. I'm a math and science teacher. Some of y'all young, some of y'all young people, y'all, y'all, you think your child's so wonderful and so perfect. Go to the school so you can see that they got me living in a cave. Oh, they real good at church. But just drive around the block during dismissal. Wait till recess and just kind of take a look at what your wonderful, sanctified, long skirt wearing child 
is doing. That ain't the message, but it's Youth Sunday, so shouldn't have invited me. Be seated, please. Y'all said, y'all said that it would be easier now. Give your life to God. Give your life to God. Mm -hmm. He'll help you overcome your struggles. He'll help you overcome your addictions. And yes, he will. Uh huh. But you're going to go through. Mm -hmm. Our commercial and our branding makes it seem like once you give your life to God, all your problems are over. No, they really just starting because the devil don't like to break up. Remember when you were in school and you wrote them notes that said, do you love me? Check yes, check no. Uh-huh. When you try to write the devil a breakup letter, he takes breakup kind of difficult. He don't like rejection. He wants to hold on to y'all's relationship. He wants you to still be addicted to that stuff that won't do you no good. And I know they said when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you ain't going to want that no more. Buckle your seatbelts. Uh-huh. That God will change your taste and your desire. And he will. But it is a process. Uh-huh. You're going to have to daily kill your flesh. Every day you're going to have to wake up and say, I didn't understand, Grandmama, and I apologize. God rest your soul. But now I understand why you had us on our knees all the time. I understand why you had us going to church all the time. I understand the fasting and the shut-in from Wednesday through Friday. I don't know what this church is now that y'all got going on for these young people. The church that we had to go through on Sunday morning. We had to get up and be in prayer at 9 o'clock. Prayer was from 9 to 10. Sunday school was from 10 to 11.30. We took a break because some of the saints had to go eat because they took medication. Then we came back and had prayer again. We just prayed at 9 o'clock. Uh-huh, we had to pray again for the first 15 minutes of service. And then depending on how granddad felt, we may get out of church at 2 o'clock. Sometimes it'll be 3 o'clock. And then we got to go home. Uh-uh. There was something called YPW. You mean we got to go back to church? We went back to church at 630 for YPWW, and that's when they opened the Bible, and they taught us you can't play sports, and you can't wear pants, and you can't shoot marbles because the Bible say marvel not. Grandmama, where they say that at? YPWW would be from 6.30 until 8 o'clock. Now 8 o'clock, supervisor, it's time to go home. Uh-uh. Sunday night service. We might get home about 10 or, or 10.30, but it was necessary because we were battling ourselves. We were battling our struggles. We were anointed, but we still had problems. We were anointed, but our anointing didn't change how good Bathsheba looked. We were anointed, but I still wanted her and I would kill her husband to get her. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, I venture to say that if we took a quiz or a poll, this would be one of the few scriptures that most of us know about David. Most of us would either say one or two things. He was the one that defeated Goliath, or we would say he was the one that messed up with Bathsheba. Your answer to that question really speaks a lot about forgiveness and your personality. Because if you automatically remember the bad stuff that everybody else do, you may be remembering it because it makes you feel good about how saved you not. Let's see, the car's in the garage. I may need to hurry up and get back to the temple. That's a long drive, but I'm, uh-huh. Yep, sometimes we like to see others fall because it make me feel more safe and instead of remembering the dirt that God had to come and get you out of. I decided to see what would happen if you mix gin and vodka together. Dad kept me from it, so I'm away at school my first time, and I, I'm, I'm, he ain't here no more. I got at least three hours. 
before he could pop up. So go ahead and mix that 90% gin with that 90% vodka and put it together. And when I woke up on Monday morning, I realized that the God who I had been taught about still loved me in spite of. Thank you, Jesus. Why is David in the cave? What happened? Ironically, the cave is located next near the place of his greatest accomplishment. The cave is not far from where he defeated Goliath. Well, let's go back just a little bit. Sunday school, and I'm almost done. Sunday school, David is the son of his dad. Come on, this interactive, talk to me. I wanna see what teaching going on. Where's the Sunday school superintendent? What teaching is going on at Praise Cathedral? This is an interactive part of the lesson. You get to participate with the message. His father was who? Who is his mama? We don't know. The Bible don't tell us who his mom was, but that's very important. We do know that J Jesse or David is related. He is, he got some more bite somewhere in his family. Uh-huh, because his grandmama, great-grandmama was Ruth. He got, he got Boaz in his family. If Ruth is in his family, Rahab is in his family. Don't judge David, look at your family tree. It ain't all that righteous either. Mm. David is the son of Jesse. And David is out in the field taking care of the sheep. Uh -huh. Meanwhile in the palace, Saul is the king, but Saul has been fired. He went to fight the Amalekites one day, young people, and the Lord told him, kill all the Amalekites. Wipe them out, kill the animals, kill the sheep. Don't bring nothing back, because it's contaminated. Be careful what you bring back from that college and that university. Uh-huh, leave all that, uh-huh, uh -huh. he said kill it all. Saul thought it was a better idea for me to bring the sheep and the cow back so I can sacrifice them. Uh-huh, his motive may have been right, but his obedience was wrong. And God is not concerned with your motive, because your motive don't have the sense that he got. He wants your obedience. Just do what I told you to do. You're not going to understand it. It's not going to make sense, but that's not your responsibility. Just do what I said. And he, the prophet came and said, hey, king, how did the battle go? Saul messed up because he said, hey, you should have seen what I did. You should have seen how well I fought against them. You should have seen how I used my sword. The word I is killing our church because it really ain't about you. Mm -hmm. He said, if you wiped everything out, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep? Well, I thought I would bring them back and no, no, Saul, obedience is better than so he got fired. Saul kept, uh, uh, the, uh, Samuel, he kept praying until the Lord finally told him, stop praying for Saul. I have fired him. I found me somebody else. Go down to Jesse's house in Bethlehem, and I got a king in Bethlehem. Oh, I'm waiting for the Sunday school student to get it. Go down to Bethlehem, because in Bethlehem, I got me another king. Oh, y'all still didn't get it. Oh, okay. Go down to Bethlehem. Because out of Bethlehem, I'm going to bring, okay, fast forward to the end of the message. Maybe you'll get it then. About 2,000 years ago, there was another king that went into a cave. Uh-huh. Go back. Go back. Yeah. Go back. He goes down to Jesse's house. The adjutants and the entourage pull up in the escalade in front of Jesse's house. And they go in because they're about to anoint the next king. He goes in and talks to Jesse. Uh-huh, and Jesse says, oh, I got seven wonderful sons. Let me show you them. There's Eliab, tall, light-skinned, curly head. I don't, oh, there's, uh-huh, I got somebody I can pick on. Light-skinned, uh-huh, handsome, looks the part, but the oil didn't flow. Went and got Abinadab. Abinadab, the second child, came. He looked like he could be fit to be the king, but the oil didn't flow. We went and got the third person, uh-huh, out of the seven. His name was Shammah. Shammah in the Hebrew means praise. But no, we're not going to praise right now because you're not the one. Mm -hmm. Went through all seven of the brothers. And, and he said, nope, it ain't none of them. You got to have another child. 
Jesse said, I got another child. I'm not even going to waste your time. He ain't the one. Uh, somehow you have made a mistake. You must have checked my Facebook page and got a prophecy. The king is not in this house. Nope. He said, I know what the Lord said. The prophet said, the prophet said, the king is in this house. You got to have another child. I got another child. I do, but d -d -d don't make me go get him. He's strange. He talks to animals. Uh huh. He's probably bloody and dirty. Right now, he ain't fit for this. Meanwhile, David has snuck to the window of the house, and he's hearing his father. Wait, no, he's hearing his daddy. Because your daddy and your father may not be the same thing. Your daddy may not want you, but your father has chosen you. And so he heard his daddy. He heard his daddy saying, it can't be him. No, don't go get him. Uh -uh, and the prophet said, go get him, because I know what the Lord said. Go get him. He said, no. Let me tell you one more thing. This is going to settle it. Let me tell you one more thing. When I tell you this, it's going to end the debate. This is going to tell you that he ain't the one. Because the king's supposed to fight. The king's supposed to lead the army into battle. When I read this to you, you're going to know he ain't the one. Eliab, stop crying because you wasn't chosen. Go run into my room and get my Father's Day card that's sitting on my dresser. I'm going to read to you the stuff that this boy writes, and you gonna know that he can't be the next king. They run and go get the card and bring it back. Jesse opens the card, and he reads and he says, Bless is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted. The prophet said, go get whoever wrote this. Uh -huh, and they went and got David. David came in the house bloody and dirty. Uh huh. Blood from taking care of the sheep. Dirt from the mud that God got to put you through first in order to get his anointing. But he didn't ask to be anointed. He was satisfied taking care of the animals out in the field. The animals understood who he was. They understood his personality. Uh huh. His dad questioned his mother. He wondered, was this even his son? Because he was so different from the rest of them. Uh huh. But he walked in and nobody said nothing. Please take the camera and span it around the room in Jesse's house so that you can see the reaction of everybody that is in the room. Eliab and the brothers are shaking their head. It can't be him. Look how dirty he is. I'm better than he is. Uh-huh. The mom is standing over in the corner crying because she knew something was special about David. Let me tell y'all young people something. How mama know when you do wrong and you ain't told her? Mama got an intuition that daddy ain't got. I didn't expect an amen from right here, but from right here, I thought y'all would say something. Uh-huh. My mother knew when I was with that girl. I don't know how she knew it, but she knew it. Uh-huh. Keep spanning around the camera. The adjutants are saying, now we have wasted all this gas to get to Jesse's house. Certainly this ain't the king. The dad is looking just disgusted. Nobody said nothing, but only one thing spoke. And oil ain't supposed to say nothing. But that day, the oil, the olives opened their mouth. And the olives said, I have found the reason why I was crushed. The oil flowed and got on to David. But David didn't ask to be anointed. Mm -hmm. If David knew what he was about to go through, would he have ran out of that house? If he knew what he would have to endure, if he knew how his family would treat him after he got his anointing, if he knew Bathsheba, when he, uh, 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 David got anointed and went back out into the field. David got anointed and went back out to the field. Oh, yeah, okay. David got anointed and went back out to the field. Because just because you're anointed, it don't mean it's your time yet. You got to learn how to shoot a bear and a lion. Those are prerequisite classes in order for you to know how to deal with Goliath later on. Stop trying to skip the process. 
The process is necessary so that you will know how to handle. Stop trying to skip to the mop, to the mic, if you haven't learned how to mop yet. Learn how to mop first. Learn how to clean and serve. Learn how to treat others right that won't treat you right. Then get on the mic so that you can have something to talk about because now you're talking from your experience and not just from Sermon Central. You're talking about what you've been through and not just what I found on YouTube. You're talking about the cave that you was in your own self. Turn and tell your neighbor again, I didn't ask to be anointed. Thank you, Jesus. Uh huh. David goes back out to the field and now he is waiting. He's not waiting because he is upset or disappointed. He don't even know that he's waiting because your anointing was given to you to solve a problem. And until the problem is solved, you got to wait for your opportunity. Don't fuss at pastor. Don't fuss at bishop. Y'all not giving me a chance. Uh-uh. It's just that the anointing that you receive has not had a problem yet. You are anointed to solve a problem. And you're not waiting on God, you waiting on Goliath. You're not waiting on God to give you an opportunity, you waiting on a problem to arise. Because the main reason why David was anointed was to deal with Goliath. So one day there's this 12 foot giant hollering and talking smack to the children of Israel. And Goliath is in, well really ain't no fighting going on, they're just talking a whole lot of smack. Goliath saying, send your God down, send your soldier down here, and we'll send our best soldier. And the one that wins, we'll serve that God. The Israelites are fighting the Philistines. Uh-huh. But really ain't nobody fighting. They just arguing. They just talking smack. Your mama just, oh, oh, oh no, you in Texas, watch it. Mm-hmm. They just talking smack. One day at the house, Jesse tells David, pack a lunch and take it down to your brothers, because they are in the army. Mm -hmm. take, take it, go see them. David is the first Uber Eats driver, I'm teaching. He gets in the Uber and takes the food down to the battle. I mean, it's you Sunday, give me a little slack. Uh -huh. Drives the food down to the battle. And when he gets down there, his brothers meet him. Man, what you doing here? Mm -hmm. Who's taking care of those few sheep you got at home? Why you got to insult my ministry because you hate me? Why you got to, what you mean these only few sheep? Them few sheep took care of you when you was hungry. Uh-huh. Them few sheep gave you the strength to be down here in this battle. What are you doing here? David said, is it not a cause? Who is that hollering and talking about my God? I'll go down there and fight him. David, you too little, you too small, you too young. No, I'll go because I know the anointing that I got. My anointing was for this moment. So I'll go down and fight. Here comes Saul out of a tunnel, hiding somewhere, and takes his armor off and puts it on David. Oh, young people, I came to help you out today. On you Sunday, uh-huh, they put that old stuff on David. And David said, nope, I can't wear this because I have improved it. Praise Cathedral. Take your old armor off of these young people. I didn't say take the word off. I said take your, that stuff, Saul was hiding in the cave. So what good was your armor doing for you? If it didn't work for you, why are you putting it on these young people? God is dealing with them in a different way. God is gonna talk to them in a different way. Take y'all anointing off of Joseph. Where's Joseph Connor at? Take, your, anoint, take that off of Hannah. Take it off of these young people and let them know God by the way he introduced himself to them. Let them know God with a slingshot and five rocks. Because if your armor was the answer, why are you hiding in the cave? David said, take this stuff off of me. This ain't going to work. All I need is five smooth stones and a slingshot. Uh-huh. Here's another participatory part of the lesson. You get to decide which way the lesson goes now. You ready? There are two reasons why David asked for five rocks. 
He knew he would only need one, but there are two reasons. A is a ghetto south side of Chicago reason. B is a theological reason. If you want A, clap your hands, the ghetto answer. Clap your hands and make some noise in the house. Okay, y'all want the theological. If you want the theological answer with your sanctified self, clap your hands and say B. I don't like that. I'm going with A. Mm -hmm. Why did he pick five stones when he only needed one? It's because, uh -huh, according to history, Goliath had four brothers. And then in the city of Chicago, uh-huh, I got one in the clip for all your brothers in case one of them want to run up to. <laughs> Supervisor, that's not biblical. That's the ghetto south side of Chicago answer. Here's the sophisticated praise cathedral theological answer. There are five gifts in the church. Prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastor, teacher. Which one of those rocks do you think David is about to teach Goliath a lesson? So he took out the teaching rock, put it in the slingshot, used the Pythagorean theorem that says a, pl a squared plus B squared equals C squared. That the hypotenuse is always opposite the long side C. That two lines, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And he knew if the lines ran parallel, I closed the distance, I could shoot him right in his forehead. That's for y'all to keep writing notes back to the teacher saying, I don't understand my child's homework. Stop writing them notes and get on YouTube and learn this math. And the rock hit Goliath in the head and he fell backwards. Mm -mm. He fell forward. Uh-uh, uh-uh, why? That's not physics, that's not science. Why did he fall forward? I got two answers. One of them is a ghetto south side of Chicago answer. The other one is a little bit more theological. Which one do you want to hit first, the ghetto answer? Thank you. I was hoping y'all would go. Uh-huh. Three times in the scripture, the Bible says that before Goliath when a man carrying a shield. And so when David hit him in the head and he fell forward, I just want to believe and picture that this 12, year, 12 foot giant fell on top of the man that was protecting him. The Lord said, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to take care of your enemy and I'm going to take care of your prayer partner because your prayer partner, the one that's been helping your enemy. I'm going to take care of both of them. Uh-huh. That's my ghetto answer. The theological answer is, the Bible simply says, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. So they, did Goliath had to fall to his knees. Now, everything is wonderful. But the choir came to the ceremony. And the choir started singing songs. Everything was fine, but the choir started singing songs that said, Saul has killed his thousands, but, but David has killed his. Be careful when people start singing about you. Be careful when people start talking about how effective you are. Mm -hmm. Be careful when your ministry gets attention because you'll be surprised who it is that can't stand your guts. The one that you played the heart for, meaning the one that you ministered to, and you drove the evil spirit that came from the Lord. That's a whole nother message. Because the devil wants y'all to know some of the stuff y'all blame on him, it wasn't him, it was the Lord that sent an evil spirit on Saul. Yeah. Why did you anoint me yeah. with a wonderful spirit yeah. and then send an evil spirit on Saul? Yeah. Why did you anoint me just to put me in trouble? Yeah. Who told Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go? Yeah. 
Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? The biggest battle that you got is not with your enemy. The biggest battle you got is not with yourself. The biggest battle you got is with this God who decides to do what he want to do. And he don't ask you how you feel about it. Once you get past that, your enemy is easy. Your biggest problem is saying yes to the Lord. I feel that y'all didn't agree with that. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will. Let your will be done. Tell your neighbor again, I didn't ask to be anointed. So now he got to run. And he runs first to the Philistines. He runs to, you know you in trouble when you got to run to the enemy. You got to run from the church to go stay with the enemy. He's with the Philistines. But the Philistines recognized him and said, now wait a minute, you, you killed Goliath. What you doing here? You got to get up out of here. He said, at least let my mother and father stay. Because I got to run. I got to be flexible. I don't know where they're going to catch me yet. And I got to go. Let my mama stay here. I believe she was a Moabite. I can't prove it. But I believe because they let her in and she stayed. Uh huh. And now David is on the run. And he got to run and he is in a cave. This is not why I was anointed. This is not what the Lord said. What do you do? when it don't look like what God said. What are you doing? You said, I'm going to be the king. This has to be the furthest point from being in the palace that David ever experienced. Now I am in the cave and I'm by myself. Kings don't live in the cave. Uh huh. They live in the castle. But kings are made in a cave. You're not made in the castle. Uh-uh. You born to lead. I figured something out. We're trying to make a lot of people leaders that God has not called to be a leader. The only way you can be a leader is if you call to be a leader. We can't make people what they are not. Oh, let me see how this go over. He that findeth a wife finds a good thing. You trying to figure out why you can't make her no wife. You wasn't supposed to. You were supposed to find her a wife. She was supposed to exhibit wife character before you married her. You can't make a man a man just with a ring. That don't mean he no husband. He ought to be a husband with those characteristics before you put the ring on his finger. David is in the cave, but he is a leader. Leaders don't belong here, but there's a boot camp you got to go through. Uh huh. Now he's by himself. I, I, I'm, I'm done. He's by himself, and he is in this cave. I'm alone. What happened? I'm not with my mama. I ain't seen my brothers. I'm all by myself. He said I was, I was anointed. I was fine taking care of the animals. I didn't ask to be anointed. Look at where the anointing has led me. Look at where I'm stuck now, and I'm all by myself. Wouldn't it be nice if David had somehow took out a pen and paper and wrote down his thoughts while he was in the cave? Oh, that would have been really good if we had some kind of record somewhere. Oh, I wish I had a Sunday school student in the room who already knows that there are three songs that David wrote while he was in the cave. Uh huh. Don't read them in order, because if you read them in order, you're going to miss the context. He wrote Psalm 34, Psalm 57, and Psalm 142. Do not read them in order, because Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Wait, don't celebrate it, because that's not your first response when you get into a cave. You didn't automatically say, well, everything going to be okay. It was a process for you to get to that point. So what you got to do is read the last one first. And when you read Psalm 142, he cries and says, why me? Why me? Why me? How did I get myself in this? In this? I didn't ask for this. The Bible writes it twice. I wonder if it's because the sound was bouncing off the empty walls of the cave. Why am I in this? But then his situation did not change. So he kept writing and he wrote Psalm 57. And he went from why me to help me. 
help me, help me. I'm in distress, distress, distress. His situation still didn't change, except he got a knock on the cave door. And at the door were 400 people, but they all had problems. They couldn't help him out of his situation. You want to know what ministry is? Taking your last and giving it to somebody else who ain't got nothing. That's what, oh, we think that this is ministry. No, it ain't. Ministry is killing somebody else's Goliath while you're struggling with your own. David is in a cave and can't, can't take care of his own self. What is he going to do? Trying to help 400 other people that got problems. But what did verse 2 say? Verse 2 said, and David was made a captain where? In the cave. Not at Jesse's house. Not when he killed Goliath. He's made a captain in the cave. Please notice one more thing. The audience that's with him in the cave. Go back to Jesse's house when he got anointed and they hated him. Them same people that was in Jesse's house, they hated him, have now found him in the cave because they had to come and get some help. If your ministry does not include your enemy, you're not working for God. You're not going to do ministry without working with those or even for those that really didn't want you to be anointed in the first place. So some of them same brothers that got mad at Jesse's house have come into the cave and now they're asking David for help. Here's a sign of your salvation. It's not how long your skirt is, I'm so sorry. It's not whether you wear no, don't wear no makeup or don't, you don't go to the movies cause you're not sitting in the seat of the scornful. It's scornful seats in the movies, there's scornful seats in the church. So that ain't the answer either. Your salvation is measured by when you get back on top, how do you treat those below you? Joseph's salvation could be measured in how he treated his brothers. So can David. Joseph had an opportunity to kill all his brothers, but instead he gave them food. Here's David now with an opportunity to get back at his dad and his brothers. But David realized I got a greater purpose and I ain't got time to spend it on y'all. I got a greater purpose. I have a greater destiny. And my purpose is over my preference. My preference is that I slice your throat. But I don't want to do that right now because that might hinder me on my way to my purpose. I don't want to interrupt my purpose by stopping and dealing with you right now. So what we're going to do, we're going to have boot camp. Y'all going to learn how to shoot. We're going to go and get saw. Stand up and line up. Stand up with yourself. And the first thing we going to learn before we leave out of this cave is Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be in my my soul shall the humble shall hear there and be oh magnify the Lord and let us I didn't ask to be anointed. God bless Praise Cathedral. Somebody in here like me, we are in a cave. Thank you, Jesus. I confess as I stand before you today, what you heard was my testimony, not a message. I'm in a cave right now. I don't want to do this. I'd rather be at home with my kids. I'd rather be with trying to repair a broken marriage. Mm -hmm. I've messed up. I thought, Bishop, that if I sin, the Lord would take this responsibility away from me. But it didn't. The Lord told me that all you're doing is making yourself more qualified to go and tell somebody else about my grace and my mercy. The key is to understand that the one that put you in the cave is the one that got the key. At one point, a spider had weaved a web 
over the entrance to the cave. And the Bible says Saul, looking for David, walked right past. Another time he stopped and used the bathroom and didn't know the one he was looking for was right there. Sometimes that spider looks like it's come to cause you problems, but it's really that web that's protecting you. We may be in the cave today, but the answer is in the word of God. God is able to deliver you out of your cave. He's able to fix every situation. You think that because you've messed up, there is no answer. You think because of what you did wrong and the devil is constantly reminding and tormenting you, even while you're standing and teaching other people about your past. But God is faithful. But God is greater. And the answer to your problem is right here at the altar. I'm not even going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. And while you bow your head, I ask that you believe, not in Elder Peyton, believe in the word. God, our Father, your word says that we have an opportunity to come before you and that we can be honest. God, forgive us, first of all, for doubt. Forgive us for sin. Forgive us for unbelief. Forgive us for even a struggle of accepting that this is your will for our life. God, help us. We may be in a cave of depression. We may be in a cave of loneliness. Some of us may be in a cave of financial trouble. But the answer is Psalm 34, we will bless the Lord. We know that the answer to come out of the cave is how we bless and magnify your name. Give us the strength. Give us the forgiveness. Give us the grace. Give us the mercy to come out and to give your name to praise. God, help us. And we'll be careful to serve your people. Help us. And we'll minister to other people. God, help us. Help us to come out. Help us to get better. Deliver us from ourselves so that we may be useful to others. God, help us on today. You know the one that's here. You know that's one that's watching at home online. Touch them with your spirit even now. Touch them and deliver them from out of their situation. Bless these young people here at Praise Cathedral. Put your word down. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Put your spirit down in these young people. Guard their hearts and their minds. Let them know that you are the greatest thing in the universe. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory. If you believe it, praise him now. If you believe that he is able, clap your hands and praise him now. I didn't ask to be anointed, but he saw the best in me.
and tell them, say, we are Praise Cathedral, Church of God in Christ. I don't believe I have a witness, but the Bible says that when praises go up, blessings come down. 